Welcome to the Master's House. Praise the wonderful name of Jesus. Nothing I'm going to say in your hearing tonight has not already been said in the house of the Lord last week. And our, as uh, God bless Brother Uncle Bill for the things that he shared from his heart. Amen. What a great time we had in God's house. Wasn't there a spirit of joy on Friday night with the King's Messengers? What a great time we had. Uh, it was this past week. Uh, or a week ago, I had wrote something down in my little book here, and I wrote down Kadesh Barnea, and uh, our topic for study that week happened to be the, uh, oh, I've forgotten, the events of the children of Israel in the wilderness, wilderness events and places, and then last Sunday, before I left for church, I looked up a few scriptures, and I wrote down the word grasshoppers. And lo and behold, wouldn't you know, we come to service. Last Sunday, Brother Corbett preaches a great, wonderful message, and his closing point was, don't be a grasshopper, right? Don't think of yourselves as grasshoppers. And uh, so I was like, all right, I'm done. All I got to do is walk up there and say, shall we stand, play the video, and we could be dismissed. Amen? Amen. Well, I'm not going to say anything different than that. But blessed be the wonderful name of Jesus. Lord, have your way in your house. Amen. Because I ask the Lord, speak those things to me in my own life, in my own heart, so that I might learn a lesson, even though it's been preached on from the front to the back for many, many years. Lord, is there something else maybe that I've been missing and haven't paid attention to? And uh, I want to pay attention to it today. So you remember, all of you studied it this past week how the Lord brought the Israelites out of Egypt and began to teach them his ways and took them to the Mount Sinai and, and showed him all the great and wonderful things and gave them the Ten Commandments and all those things. And then they departed from Mount Sinai. You guys remember all this in your studies? And where did they go? That's right, they went to Kadesh Barnea. And now there's all these uh, different thoughts about Kadesh Barnea. It's referred to as Kadesh in God's Word. It's referred to as Kadesh Barnea. And there's uh, a couple of different uh, thoughts that Kadesh Barnea and Kadesh were two separate places. There's also uh, a thought that Kadesh and Kadesh Barnea is the same place. There's also a thought that uh, the children of Israel never left Kadesh Barnea once they got there. They just kind of uh, meandered around that same area, and that was a central hub for them for the 30, 48 year, 30 40 years that they were there, and they were always there in uh, Kadesh Barnea. But as you know, when they've got there, uh, they sent the spies out into the land, and I'm going to move along quickly. And uh, they went out for 40 days and for 40 nights to uh, spy out the land, and we're going to pick up the story in Numbers, the 13th chapter, beginning with the 25th verse. All righty? Yes. And they returned from searching the land after 40 days, and they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel and to the wilderness of Paran to Kedesh, and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation, and showed them the fruit of the Lamb. And they told him, and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Praise the Lord. When God says it flows with milk and honey, it flows with milk and honey. Yes. Blessed be your wonderful name, Jesus. He didn't lie about it. He didn't make it up. It certainly is a great and a wonderful land. Nevertheless... The people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and are very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there, and the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites. They also dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and the coast of Jordan. Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord. That doesn't change anything! The land still flows with milk and honey, and the blessings of God are still there! doesn't matter what else is there. The promise of God is still there. Amen. Praise your wonderful name, Jesus. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let's go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. It doesn't matter how big they are. It 
doesn't matter how great they are. It doesn't matter how many of them there are. It doesn't matter how entrenched they are. God said we can have it. Let's go and get it. Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Yes. But the men that went up, kept still the people before Moses said, let's go now and let's go get it. But the men that went up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. You know what? That may be true. But that's okay because God said we could take it. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel saying, the land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof and all the people that we saw in it were men of great stature. And they, and there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which came, to, which come to of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, so were we in their sight. You know what? So what? If the land is full of giants, so what? If they are big and powerful and a great people, so what? If they have walled cities. If God says we can take it, then we can. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We know they took it, right? Check this out, folks. The children of Israel that brought back the, the bad report, they did not lie. Certainly there were giants there. Certainly they were great peoples. Certainly they had big cities and walled cities. But the difference was between Caleb and Joshua and them is Caleb and Joshua believed the report of the Lord. Amen. See, the, the difference is, and, and this is what was stirred up in my heart, I know this has spoke on before, is they said, we are grasshoppers in our own sight. Yes. Not that when I was spying out the land, not that they heard the Anakins and the Amorites and the Canaanites and all those people hadn't heard what a great deliverance God brought us out of Egypt and did all these great and wonderful things. Maybe at that time they didn't think we were grasshoppers. Maybe they were starting to worry about this children of Israel that's coming across the desert. But because I thought of myself as a grasshopper, then they thought of me as a grasshopper. Lord, how am I viewing myself in today's world? Am I thinking that I'm a grasshopper? For here are all your promises. Here is all the great and mighty and wonderful things that you said that we can have, that we can possess, that we can be a part of. But no, I'm just this lowly little educated sheet metal man that ain't worth the hill of beans. And now all those people out there think he's nothing but a worthless little sheep metal man not worth a hill of beans. How do I view myself? See, the difference was Caleb viewed himself through the eyes and the glory and the wonder of Almighty God. They began to get worried. They began to complain. They began to get uh, concerned. And then they began to disbelieve. See, it was a process. It was a process that they began way when they were delivered out of Egypt. They began to need something. They began to worry about that something. It didn't come to pass the way they thought it should. So they began to complain about it. And then they began to not believe anymore. And it was a process that they developed time and time and time again. There's a scripture in there where God said to Moses, these ten times... And I believe it was six or eight months ago, Brother Garrett ran through all ten of those times that the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron and against the Lord. How do I see myself? Do I see myself the way God sees me? Or do I see myself through the eyes of disbelief and the eyes of complaining and the eyes of worry? How do I see myself today? We know that a certain span of time had taken place. And in Numbers, the 14th chapter, and the 17th verse, you know, they gave the bad report. And God said, that's it. They were going to stone Moses and Aaron and, uh, Aaron and uh, Joshua and Caleb. And God's like, I'm going to take them all out. I'm going to wipe everybody out right now. And, and uh, Moses fell on his face and humbled himself and cried out unto the Lord. 
And this is what part of the prayer that Moses said on behalf of the children of Israel in the 14th chapter, beginning with the 17th verse. And now I beseech thee, let thy power of the Lord be great according as thou hast spoken, saying, The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation. Pardon, I beseech the iniquity of this people according to thy, greatness, mer uh, thy great mercy, and as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. Don't you appreciate a man of God that will lay on his face on your behalf when you might be a little downtrodden and you might be a little worried and you might be a little bit of complaining and you might even be carrying a little bit of unbelief. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. But as I truly live, all the earth shall be filled with my glory, the glory of the Lord. Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened unto my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto the fathers, neither shall they any of them that provoke me to see it. Isn't that amazing? It, it, it just baffles the mind, doesn't it? They were there. They saw the mighty hand, the mighty works that God did to bring up out of Egypt. And the plagues were on all of Egypt. And the plagues didn't come upon them. And yet still, God brought them out by a great and mighty hand. And they saw that they needed a need. And they started complaining about it. They started worrying about it. And did God, did he strike them down? No, he forgave them. And he met their need anyway. Because God is long-suffering. And God is full of mercy. And his spirit doesn't want anybody to perish but that all would come to repentance. But God, when he says a thing, he's going to do that thing. And even though a man of God could lay on his face, God's word went forth, they will not inherit the land. And surely in God's judgment there was mercy. He didn't strike them dead, and they wandered through the wilderness until that entire generation had passed. But my servant Caleb... Because he had another spirit with him and had followed me wholly, him will I bring into the land wherein he went, and his seed shall possess it. Oh, Lord, my God, let there be a different spirit found in me as there was a spirit in Caleb, as there was a spirit in Joshua. Let not let there be a spirit of complaining or worry or stress or unbelief in me, but let there be a, a spirit of faith and a spirit of encouragement. It doesn't matter how, God, you choose to give me those promises. All I know is I want a piece of them. All I know is you said it. I believe it, and it's going to be true. Blessed be the name of the Lord. My God shows mercy and judgment. In Deuteronomy, the second chapter, and the 14th verse. In the space in which we came from Kadesh Barnea until we came over the brook Zered was 30 and 8 years. Woo! Yeah. Until all that generation of the men of war were wasted out from among the host as the Lord swore unto them. For indeed the hand of the Lord was against them to destroy them from among the hosts until they were consumed. Praise the wonderful name of Jesus. God is a good, wonderful, and a merciful God. He allowed them to live out your days. You didn't believe me. You're not going to inherit my promises. But let me tell you about the great, wonderful, mercifulness of the Lord Jesus Christ. For the great God of heaven and earth still cares about his people even in their hour of complaining, even in their hour of worry, even in their hour of disbelief, God still shows mercy and makes a way for his children. They sing, uh, brother, Pastor Paul used to sing a song around here, then sometimes the praise team sings it. I may be out of God's will, but I am never out of God's care. Oh, blessed Jesus, thank you so much. In Nehemiah, the ninth chapter, beginning with the 19th verse, Yet thou in thy manifold mercies forsookest them not in the wilderness, for the pillar of cloud departed not from them by day to lead them in the way, neither the pillar of fire by night to show them light and way in the way therein they should go. 
Thou gavest them also thy good spirit to instruct them, and thou withheldest not thy manna from their mouth, and gavest them water to drink. Yea, forty years did thou sustain them in the wilderness, so that they lacked nothing, neither their clothes waxed old, or their field, or excuse me, their feet swelled not. Certainly God is a merciful and a wonderful God. Amen. Amen. So then a time of period have passed. Everybody from the older generation just about passed away. We know that uh, in the next few scriptures, those last remaining could have been uh, Miriam and Aaron and Moses, maybe a few others, but for the most part, 36 to 38 years they've been wondering, and they find themselves back in Kadesh Barnea. God's saying, I want you to cross over the brook Zered. And they're back there in Kadesh. We pick up the story in Numbers, the 20th chapter, beginning in the second verse. The first verse talks about Miriam dying. Uh, but here they are. This is a group of people, all those that complained and couldn't believe to attain the promises of God, that worried, that complained about everything, that disbelieved. They were pretty much passed away. Here is a new generation that came up. And this is what blew my mind because I never put the two and two together and came up with five. I do that a lot, actually, to tell you the truth. But most of that generation had passed away, and it was a new generation that was raised up. And they needed water, and they were worried about having some water. They had a need. And instead of complaining, or instead of crying out to the Lord humbly, for certainly God is the creator of heaven and earth and knows that I need something to drink when I'm in the wilderness. Certainly God, the great God of heaven and earth, creator of all things, knows that I've got cattle, knows that I got sheep, knows that I got things that they got to have water in order to sustain life. Certainly God is aware of all of this. But instead of humbling and asking God, or instead of having faith, or instead of having excitement saying, where is God going to work a miracle next? Where is God going to move next? No, I had a need, I got worried, and then I started complaining. Here we are, you don't care about us, God. We need some water, we're thirsty, we got to feed and water the flocks. What are we going to do? That Moses, he should have left us in Egypt. That generation supposedly passed away. What did the, did the old generation wear off on the new generation that was raised up to inherit the promises? Instead of believing God and crying out and recognizing over all these years that God always provided a way, instead of being excited about where is the next miracle going to come from, how is God going to make this happen, oh man, I got this need, I'm starting to worry about it, now I'm going to start complaining about it. And you know what happens when somebody starts to complain? It's like a snowball. Huh? It's like a, a sickness, it's like a disease. One person starts to complain, yada, 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 yada. Any other person they're complaining to, even if they're struggling not to be a part of it, well, you know what, yada, 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 X, Y, Z, and so forth and so on. And then somebody over here hears it and said, Scooby-Doo, bop, shoo, wop, bop, ba, doo, bop, bam, boom, bing, right? <laughs> Pretty soon, there's a whole mess of us griping and complaining. My goodness, we need some water. Man, God needs to strike that Moses. Man, God, why haven't you given us this and that? You said all these great, wonderful things. How come none of that's starting to happen? Blah, 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 blah. X, Y, Z, blah, 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 blah. I don't even believe it. Because that's where it starts. I have a need. I begin to think God can't take care of it. And then I start getting more and more worried about it. The more and more worried about it, I start complaining about it. The more and more I start complaining about it, pretty soon I don't believe it anymore. There was the pattern way back then, and it rubbed off on the younger generation. Praise the Lord, they still believed that they could inherit the promised land, but here we are, out of water. Moses is frustrated. Moses is tired. He goes out there. God speaks to Moses and Aaron and says, I want you to go out there and I want you to speak to the rock. Take the rod in your hand and I want you to speak to the rock so that I may be sanctified. Moses is probably pulling out the last little bit of his hair, right? 
The people just, yeah, 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 yeah. In the name of the Lord, let there be water. And he hits the rock. But blessed be the wonderful name of God who shows mercy and judgment and lets the water come forth to water those that are thirsty. Thank you, Jesus. But Jesus said, because you did not sanctify me, you cannot enter into. See, he was prophesied 38 years earlier. The word of the Lord said, nobody save who? Save Joshua and Caleb shall enter in. And here's the fulfillment of that prophecy, because prophecy, Moses and Aaron, they smote the rock instead of speaking to it. And God said, because you did not sanctify me, you will not enter in. Has any of that rubbed off on the next generation that's come up? Have I forgot to teach them how to believe in the Lord and trust in Him always and, and that even it doesn't matter if, if you don't know how it's going to turn out and you're not sure how it's going to work out, just bless the name of Jesus. Just honor Him because it's always going to work out. He never tells us all the time how it's going to work out. But you ever notice? It always works out. Why? Because God promised it. And God cannot go back on His Word. He is not a man that He should lie to any of us. All those promises are sure and true. And we can possess them. And we can inherit all of those great and wonderful things. As he sees fit, blessed be the wonderful name of the Lord. I don't know how it's going to happen, but how is it going to work out this time, Lord? That's how we need to be thinking. Lord, I'm thirsty. How are you going to give me something to drink? Blessed be your wonderful name, Jesus. Instead of, oh, man. Thirsty again. I trust you and I believe you, Jesus. All these things happen after the generation. Most of that generation passed away. The Lord said, cross over this brook because he wanted them to begin to, to take the land. And they, in Numbers, the 21st chapter, and when the king of Arad, the Canaanite, which dwelt in the south, heard tell that the Israel came by the way of the spies, then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. And Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou will indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord hearkened unto the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. And he called the name of the place Hormah. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. God provided the water. God provided a victory in the battle. God gave them a way to, to gather back those lost brothers and sisters that were taken by the adversary and brought them back. And here they were. I don't want to cross through Edom. But God had given a word to Esau that this was your inheritance and he wasn't going to take it from him. So he said, I want you children of Israel to go around Edom. I don't want you to meddle with them. I don't want you to mess with them because I gave them that land for their inheritance. You go around this way. I don't want to go around this way. This is the long way. This is the hard way. You know, Lord, I'm just saying the distance between two points, the shortest distance is a straight line. Can't we just beeline it across there? I don't want to go this way. I, two miles, 500, Lord, I'm just saying. Right? But the Lord said, no, I want you to go this way. And they were discouraged because of the way. Now, this is the generation. Supposedly, that complaint generation already passed. But I learned how to be that way from my elders. And the Lord, people spake against God because they didn't want to go that way and against Moses. Wherefore, have you brought us out of Egypt into this wilderness? And there is no bread, neither is there any water, for our soul loatheth this light bread. Oh, my Lord. Do I not appreciate the provisions 
that God has prepared for me that I'm going to complain about it? I don't even, no water, no bread, Lord. We don't even like this manna that you provided from heaven. And you know what? I don't care about this cloud by the day, which is keeping the sun off of me, which is actually keeping me from getting a sunburn all the time. And you know what? I don't even care about that pillar of fire, which is helping us when we travel at night to know the way we could see so we're not tripping over stones and falling into holes. I don't appreciate any of that. Oh, Lord, let there be a different spirit found inside of me as was found in Joshua and Caleb. Amen. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much of the uh, people died because they had sinned against the Lord and spoken this evil against God and against Moses. And the Lord told Moses to make a fiery serpent of, and to lift it up, and whenever they got bit, if they were to look upon it, they should live. And if that wasn't enough, as if my worrying and my complaining and my disbelief wasn't enough and my unappreciation for the things that God has provided for me, then I'm, I'm, I'm passing through the way of Moab. And we know that uh, the, the prince of Moab uh, hired Balaam, Balak hired Balaam to prophesy against me and to say all these uh, evil things about me. And every time Balaam stood above us, he just prophesied goodness and great things before Balak on all of God's children. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. As if that wasn't enough. We were sitting there, we were camped out, and these people from Moab came. They were just the nicest people. And they invited me and my family over for a barbecue. I didn't think it would hurt. I went to the barbecue. And we got to, you know, we're, man, it was great burgers, and, and we have a great time of fellowship. And really, man, we had so many things in, in common, you know. Sometimes we, neither one of us have any water. Sometimes neither one of us have any bread. And we just really hit it off great and everything and just started fellowship with one another. And it just so happens that, crazy, isn't it? This Moab family has a daughter that's not married, and I happen to have a son who's not married. Isn't that crazy? And they just hit it off, and they just got along so well with one another. And then her father came to me and asked if they could take my son to, be, uh, to marry their daughter. And I was like, well, absolutely. That's, that sounds wonderful. That sounds great. Well, I'll tell you what. We're going to have this great party, and we're gonna, uh, our families are going to get together in this great wedding celebration. And check this out. We're going to worship our God over here is uh, Baal Peor, and we're going to bless the wonder, his wonderful name and magnify him. And we just want you to participate. If you don't feel comfortable, you don't necessarily have to do anything, but we want you to be here. And go ahead and have this drink, because this is an offering that we're going to give unto this Baal Peor. And now all of a sudden, I'm committing the whoredoms of Baal Peor. And I'm giving my sons and my daughters in marriage of those that are wicked, that don't even follow the same God that I follow, that don't even believe the same things that I believe. Because I didn't necessarily believe, and because I was complaining, and oh man, it looks grass looks greener on the other side, and I'm just gonna accept all these great and wonderful things that I participate in the whoredom of Bel Peor. And the Lord says unto Moses, "Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel." See, it started with me having a need. Then I started complaining, and then I started not believing, and then I started looking somewhere else for an answer. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one his men that were joined unto Bel Peor. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his, his brethren a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of the congregation and of the children of Israel who were weeping before the Lord at the tabernacle of the congregation. And when Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand and went after the man of Israel into his tent and thrust both them through the man of Israel and through the woman through her belly so that the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. And those that died in that plague were twenty and four thousand.
after all of this, none of these promises were slack. I may have been slack in believing and trusting God for them. I may have been slack in how I reacted to those things, but all of those things were still, guess what? The land still flowed with milk and honey. Those blessings and those promises are still just as true today as they were 40 years ago when God proclaimed it to us. Amen? Amen. The difference was, surely none of the men that came up out of Egypt from 20 years and old or upper shall see the land which I swore unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, because they have not wholly followed me, save Caleb the son of Jephna, the Kezanite, and Joshua the son of Nun, for they have wholly followed the Lord. The difference is Caleb's different spirit was that he wholly followed the Lord. That means when he had a need, he cried out unto the Lord in the right way. That he put his trust in him and didn't worry about how God was going to make it happen. What does that mean? That means he wasn't complaining about it. That means he was looking for God to manifest His glory in whatever way and however way God sought to do it and receive the promises that God set before them. The difference is Caleb and Joshua believed God at His word. Can I today just believe God at His word? You said all of these things. You meant all of these things. These all things are true. Can I just take you at your word, Lord? We read the scripture where it says, we saw ourselves as grasshoppers. So they saw us as grasshoppers. The difference between them and Joshua and Caleb is Joshua and Caleb saw themselves the way God saw them. Lord, I want to see me as you see me. Because if I could see you as you because you know how I'm going to see myself as that good for nothing sheet metal man. Who doesn't know a lick of snot? Right? But God doesn't see me that way. Brother Bill just testified to every single one of us exactly how God sees you. You are my beloved. Lord, how do you see me? You know what? I asked the Lord, how do you see me, Lord? Because that's where it starts to change. Is if I could see you the way you see me, God. Not the way I could tell you how I see me. And it ain't a pretty picture. But Lord, how do you see me? Here's what's so great and wonderful about God. He don't see things the way we see things. You see me up here as a snot-nosed guy that's just yelling and waving around, and you're ready for me to close. God sees me completely different. Oh, blessed be the wonderful name of Jesus for not seeing me the way the world sees me. Amen? Amen? The Lord spake to me one word, or can I say it like that and be so presumptuous? And I've testified to this story, I don't know, five or six times in your hearing. And when I thought about it again, it just melted my heart again. And I began to just weep. You know what? I said, Lord, how do you see me? Now, this is going to sound funny. The word was daughter. My eyes just well up with tears, just like they're doing again right now. He thinks of me as his daughter. That's weird, Thomas. That is really weird. We are thinking of you very weirdly right now. <laughs> no, because it was the woman with the issue of blood that was there, and she had suffered all these years, right? And she was suffering, and she reached out and touched the hem of his garment. And you know what? Jesus didn't see her because of her infirmity or because of her sickness or her wickedness or her evilness. You know what he saw her as? His daughter. I still can't get over that. That the Lord sees me as his son. The Lord sees us as his children, my beloved children. Is that not wonderful? Praise the Lord. Yes, Lord, I made mistakes and sometimes I get worried and worked up and complain and disbelief. Son, 
There's the story of the prodigal son, and it doesn't matter if I took all my goods and went away. The father is standing at the door looking across the miles waiting for the son to return. And when he came back, he didn't say, oh, you should have done this, and I told you no. He said, no, son, I'm so glad you're back. My son, which was lost, is now found. He threw his arms around and put a robe around his shoulders and put a ring on his finger. That's how God sees us, as his beloved children. How many of us have kids? How many of us would do anything to keep our kids from hurting? We would sacrifice. We would reach down. We would do things. We would take the hit. Lord, I'll take the hit. Don't, don't let it be my son. Don't let it be my baby. Don't let it be my daughter. Do it to me. Right? So the Lord sacrificed himself. I'll take the hit so that you don't have to. Lord, let that spirit, which is the spirit of the Holy Ghost, be inside of me that when I have a need, I just cry out to you, Jesus. Lord, that's the city walls are great. There's a giant. There's all these great and horrible and wonderful things. But uh, past all of that is the promise that you will never leave me, nor will you forsake me. Before all that, I could do all things through Christ Jesus that strengtheneth me. That is the spirit of Joshua and Caleb. I could do it through Christ. Lord, how do you want to do it? This is going to be great. This is going to be awesome. Faith is not comfortable, church. Faith is not comfortable. I read the stories in Hebrew about all these great and wonderful things by faith, by faith, by faith. And it doesn't sound like these situations are comfortable. But faith may not be comfortable. But with faith, there is a reward. Because God is a rewarder of those who believe and diligently seek after him. Amen? Yeah. And that reward is true today as it was yesterday. And there's nothing that's going to change it. No giants, no great people, no walled cities. Right. If I could only just believe and just ask, Lord, how are we going to do it? This is going to be awesome. You see, I can't fulfill God's promises. I can't make those things come to pass. I don't have it within me. I don't have the ability. It doesn't matter what I do. I can't make all these great and wonderful things happen. But God can. And God will yeah. do all of those great and wonderful and marvelous things. All I have to do is say, I believe it. Lord, which way do we want to go? Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. If I'm got a need tonight. Jesus says, cast your cares on me because I care about you. If I'm worried and worried about how is this going to happen and everything like that, go to the Lord. Go to the Lord today. If you're beyond that and you're starting to complain and gripe, that's okay. Jesus loves you. Jesus cares about you. Come down here and, and have a conversation with Jesus. Ask him to touch your faith. Ask him to fill you with that right spirit. A broken spirit and a contrite heart, God will not despise. I can't be unified in the fellowship of the saints until I first get the right spirit within me. Lord, let it begin with me. Have your way in me. Mold me and make me and shape me after your will. And we could do all of those things that you said we could do. As we're standing in the house of the Lord, wherefore, if you could read in Hebrews of all about all those things and have faith, wherefore we are seeing also compassed about so great a cloud of witnesses, those that just believe and to trust in God, let us lay aside every weight which so easily does beset me, which so easily makes me worry, which so easily makes me complain, which is so easily taking me on the path of disbelief. As Brother Bill testified earlier today, as the King's Messenger saying, But let me with patience put my trust in you, Lord, 
looking to you, God, for you are the author and the finisher. You are the beginning and the end. And God is so wonderful, true. He is everything in between. I could do all things through Christ Jesus which strengtheneth me. For though ye are of God, little children have overcome them, because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And that is the Spirit of the Lord. What shall we say these, to these things and these promises and, and these giants and these grawled cities and all of these things? If God be for me, who can be against me? Praise the name of the Lord. For if I live after the flesh and I complain after the flesh and after the wants and the desires of those things, then I shall die by that. But if I with the right spirit will mortify the deeds of the body, I shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. They are the children of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again unto fear. I don't have to be bound by that worry. I don't have to be bound by that complaining. I don't have to be bound by that disbelief. God can break those chains tonight, as was testified already in our hearing. And, be, and receive the spirit of adoption and be one of the children of the Lord, whereby I cry, Father. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We all call her the woman with the issue of blood. He calls her his own. Oh, thank you, Jesus, that I could be called your own, Lord. For the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if I am his son, then I am an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. If so be that I suffer with him, that I may also be glorified together with Him. Praise the Lord. This is our promise. This is our heritage. Amen. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, no food, no water, no bread, not understanding how all these things are going to come to pass, of this present time, they're not even worried. They're not even uh, used to being, being compared with the glory of God that shall be revealed in us. All of those promises, all of those great and wonderful things, no more sorrow, no more tears, no more death. All of those things are mine as His heir. What do I need to do, Lord? Humble myself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, and He will exalt me in due time, casting all my care and worry and concern and unbelief upon Him, for He cares for me.